The legal battle between St. Luke's and Ammon Bundy and Diego Rodriguez, well, that continues. The jury is still deciding damages. They may not have heard much from the defendants, but we did. And we know it's hot out there. Maybe not as hot as last week, but still hot. So we wanted to know, what does Zoo Boise do to keep the animals cool this time of year? There's a nonprofit in Blaine County, which is in the fast lane when it comes to giving back to the community. We're gonna tell you about them and try to show them to you. The last time we checked in on the St. Luke's Ammon Bundy Diego Rodriguez saga, we were just getting into the closing chapters. Two weeks ago, we were talking about day one of the penalty phase, the damages trial, which was another day in court where neither Bundy nor Rodriguez showed up or participated. That trend continued for the entire 10 day proceeding, which wrapped up late Friday with St. Luke's asking the jury to award them $37 million in damages or at a minimum $16 million. So a quick timeline of how we got here. Back in March of 2022, Health and Welfare took custody of a child known as Baby Cyrus after doctors at St. Luke's determined he was malnourished, underweight, and in immediate danger. They did this after the parents had already missed several appointments to help get the child back on track health-wise. That child is the grandson of Rodriguez, a close friend of Bundy. So Bundy and several of his People's Rights Network followers showed up at the hospital in Meridian where the child was taken to receive that medical care and they demanded the child be given back. Well, that didn't happen and Bundy was arrested for trespassing. The protest continued though outside of St. Luke's in Boise where it got so threatening the hospital had to close for a couple of hours to visitors and divert patients to other hospitals. The child eventually improved and was returned to his parents, but by May, a couple of months later, because of the harm caused by Bundy and Rodriguez and their followers, the state of Idaho's largest health system sued the anti-government activists and a couple of companies connected to them. Even Bundy's campaign for governor was involved. They sued them for defamation, invasion of privacy, infliction of emotional distress, and trespassing. Weeks of paperwork and a lack of involvement by either Bundy or Rodriguez went by so that a default judgment was finally issued by a judge in April of this year. Not enough for St. Luke's and their attorneys, though. They wanted to expose this ordeal for what, it, what they claim it was, a money-making scheme for Bundy and his People's Rights Network and Rodriguez and his Freedom Man Press. St. Luke's attorneys also claim Bundy is actively trying to hide his assets through shell companies, selling his house to his former campaign treasurer, who then started LLCs in Montana, you know, that kind of stuff. This is something they hope to lay out in this penalty phase, which again, began two weeks ago today. Well, the jury was given the case late Friday and they deliberated until about 7 p.m., then went home for the weekend. They picked it up again today and we're still waiting to see if they can come to any conclusion. All of this has happened without much of anything from Bundy or, or Rodriguez, other than online statements and videos put out. However, Rodriguez did put together a statement he wanted read to the jury, saying things like, the world knows now that CPS, Child Protective Services, is a government subsidized child trafficking operation and every claim he made about St. Luke's is true, therefore, no defamation. Bundy put out another statement today saying, massive institutions combined with the state financially benefiting when they take a child is one of the worst combinations a parent can imagine. People in a jury deciding how much St. Luke's is going to take from those who expose them is a mockery to justice. Just part of what he said. So you may be wondering, what's taking the jury so long? Well, according to KTV reporter Alexandra Duggan, who has been at the courthouse most of these last two weeks, nine of the 12 jurors have to agree on how much money is awarded on each claim of invasion of privacy and emotional distress. And they have to do this for each individual plaintiff, of which there are five in this case. Oh, and they are both punitive and compensatory damages to decide. So there's two separate entities there and there may be a lot of math involved. So the final pages of this saga have yet to be written, so stay tuned. Eight of the last 10 days, we have hit at least 100 degrees here in Boise. Two days that we didn't, we're still in the high 90s, so it's hot, no matter how you look at it. We cover a lot of ground on the heat, just like staying inside, things you can do, drink water, those kind of things. Don't leave your kids and pets in the car. Another question we get from time to time is, what about the animals at Zoo Boise? Are they even able to be out and about in this heat? Do they want to be? Is it safe for them? Is it worth going to the zoo to see them in triple digit heat? Joe Paris checked in on the animals. So yeah. I guess the question is, are they used to the heat in this point? And as our Andrew Bartline pointed out, 
A lot of them come from like, you know, Africa and stuff, so they should be used to it at this point? Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, th this question has been asked in the past, you know, what about the, the animals and the heat? But yeah. I had never heard the idea of, well, the, the biology, the genealogy of a lot of these animals, they should be able to survive this heat, right? Desert animals. Desert animals. Is that the case? No. So if you haven't been to Zoo Boise, they basically have the cast of the Lion King and much, much more. But yes, a lot of animals at Zoo Boise, they have links to the country of Africa, the continent of Africa, I should say. Africa is not a country, Brian, it's a continent. True. Now, lions, wild dogs, giraffes, zebra, just some of the cast of animals that you might find in triple digit heat in their native environment. So do they like it though? Or do they just survive it? Well, let's take the African lion as an example. That's a species that comes from an area, they live on the equator. Uh, so it's typically very hot there and you would think that they would be acclimated to these kind of temperatures. But you also have to keep in mind, for example, our male lion Revan lived in Maryland for five years and he's lived here for, for just over five years now. So he is basically adjusted to Idaho weather. They are African lions, but after a few years here, they're an Idaho lion. So they have a completely different set of norms. Uh, they biologically have the ability to, ability to acclimate to a changing environment, which is good because that makes them more comfortable. But when we have unusual weather like this, uh, it presents a challenge. So yes, animals can take the heat, but why should they have to? They don't enjoy it. And Peachy says that they don't have any animals that are just thrilled about the heat it is well. I was wondering if there's any animals that love the triple digits. Not at Zoo Boise. So the heat is a major thing zoos around the world are tracking. Outside of the day-to-day -day operations, there are concerns about the global trend of warming. And this will impact animals everywhere and could determine what zoos can do in the future. So global warming is a major focus point. That's one of the things that we have to take in consideration when we talk about animals that we're going to keep here in Idaho and how we maintain them and their ability to adjust. Um, you know, evolution provides the opportunity for animals to acclimate, to adjust to a changing environment, but climate change has created a situation where it occurs so rapidly that species don't have the opportunity to adjust. And we're seeing all kinds of shifts in uh, places where particular species live. Uh, sometimes that results in a reduced ability for that species to survive. If you are dependent on water, for example, uh, water is disappearing in a number of places. That's a result of climate change and it presents kind of a dire outlook for the future. Um, we have to make the changes that are necessary to uh, abate this process before it's too late and we're rapidly approaching that point. Scientists locally and abroad, they warn of the dangers of global warming. It's nothing new, but yes, we are seeing close to record highs a lot recently. It's not just in our area, and Brian, climate and heat is something that zoos have been talking about really for the last several decades, but it is getting to the point, especially here this summer, where some zoos, especially in the southwest of our country, they're seeing such extreme heat that they wonder, you know, is this fair to the animals going forward? Yeah. Zoo Boise is not exactly in that place. We're not getting to 130 degrees like over in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, but it, there are things that, you know, that zoo curators, like Mr. Peachy and you know the director Gene Ke Peacock over at Zoo Boise, there's things that they have to take a look at heading into the future. Yeah, 25 straight days of 110 plus in Phoenix, by the way, this month alone. So that's crazy. We aren't seeing that. But something Joe didn't touch on, the specialized treats the animals do get at the zoo when we get to these hot, hot, hot days. Again, triple digits. But John Miller did this. He did touch on this 23 years ago, right about the time we began to see the number of triple digit days per summer move into the double digit territory on a regular basis. Stop by Zoo Boise and oh baby, it's hot. But thanks to Andrea Zolweg, even the crankiest couple of macaws have it made in the shade. Now I'm just turning the water on for the eagles. As she does all day long for every other feathered friend, keeping cool. Just like kids do running through a sprinkler. Even the tigers. They appreciate the water just like we do. And they'll follow the sprinklers all around their exhibits. And if that's not cool enough. Sometimes we give them things to eat like, like popsicles, except for the otters, it might be fish sickles. And for the big cats. Blood balls. Blood balls? Blood balls. Very, Frozen very balls good. of blood? Frozen balls or buckets of blood. Sorry we weren't around to see that. Blood Not exactly balls. good humor there, huh? <laughs> you know, we don't ring a little bell for them, but they do come running. While the South American raccoon thing chills in his hammock, 100 degrees even turns Bambi into a shady character. 
All's cool in the elk pool, and with Andrea and all these sprinklers running full blast, the heat's not bothering anybody. It's like water off an eagle's beak or a condor's back. Thanks to Andrea. <laughs> John Miller, Idaho's News Channel 7. What if I told you there's a place in Idaho where food receipts run the sixth highest in the country? This place also has one of the highest wealth disparities in the nation. And 52% of the people who live there are food insecure, 52%. So there's some really rich people who live there among a whole lot of not so rich people. Guess where that is in Idaho? Maybe you guess Blaine County. If you did, you're correct. This gastronomy gap is something the Blaine County Hunger Coalition has been battling for decades, and it's only gotten worse through COVID and record high inflation. But there is a large group of donors who have tried to put the pedal to the metal against hunger. They call themselves the Sun Valley Tour de Force. They're a nonprofit who focus on giving back to important programs in their community, and they're doing it in record time. Here's Andrew Bartline. Deep in the Wood River Valley, local drivers line Highway 75, but hardly to catch an eye. You know, it's Hondas, it's SUVs that all look the same. Check the, uh, hardly. Road down if you can communicate to your north end. But that can change. Ten inch till they hit the start. In an instant. Maybe 15. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get things ready to go here. So excited for you guys. Max runs the start line. You know the drill. When I give you the thumbs up, the course is yours. Until then, it's not. Now, it's a new fleet of wheels. Road's closed, we gotta go. Slotted to push the posted limit. Slotted one, Porsche clear. From the start line, the course is hot. Now we're in business. One that might not seem lucrative, considering the crowd's comprised of cheap seats. I've been in the car since I was like. It's all free. As long as I can remember. I think I was a year old when one of my one of our friends gave me my first little like hot wheels and ever since I've just been just been hooked. Nathan Johnston's part of the tight knit club up here. Oh, here we go. So that's the new McLaren 750S. That's a prototype car. So no one actually owns that car yet. It can be hard to imagine owning any of these cars. Hitting over 200 miles an hour. Uh, which is pretty cool. But a few? <laughs> Only the fastest one out here. You could probably pick up. Well, we're gonna go for kilometers an hour because it seems faster. It also feels like a race. <laughs> Lucky for most, it's not. They're incredible cars uh, and you know, people drive at their comfort limit. My friend, which is coming up here pretty soon. Uh, in fact, I should probably record this. It's not the fastest car here, but He's pushing it as hard as it'll go, which is cool. You can hear it.
That might have been the last car. Because, of course, you still have to brake. In this case, for the public to use the public road. That's when the connections are made. So right here is Kevin LaChapelle's Audi R8. So this one's supercharged and uh, it's got some Xbox emblems on it. He actually works for Microsoft and he's one of our biggest helpers in this event and helps bring in sponsors that want to make a difference in the community. From the start line, the course is hot. It's not a race, remember? They're here to push limits. Oh no, it's the other McLaren. 720S. All kinds of limits. Last year they raised $650,000 for the Hunger Coalition, just changing thousands of people's lives. It's, it's really cool. It's, it's not just about going fast, it's about raising money and giving back to the community. Not bad for free. It's a thrill of a lifetime. It's, it's incredible. When you come around that turn and they open stuff and you're just, it's like you're flying. Wrapped portion for that McLaren is probably going to be the fastest car at this event. It's, uh, I'm pretty excited to hear what he does. Good air. Or rather, cold. what she and did. I think I just got lucky and I got the fastest speed by like one mile per hour and my dad was right behind me. Alexandra Hayner drives every year. 2 18.87. That's not the all-time record. We had somebody go 246 in 2016, I believe. But it's enough today to get the attention of the man in charge. We got the sheriff setting the land speed record right now. That's the best part. I have the speeding ticket I got from last year. And when people come over, they're like, I don't tell them that it was from an event. I, everyone's very surprised that I got a speeding ticket because it's real. It's like a real ticket the sheriff department gives you. And the course is hot. Last car. Copy, last car. There's no limits. And the fastest thing about them might be how quickly they give back. It's not a competition. Um, if you set a record, great, but that's not what it's about because every year it is, it has grown exponentially, uh, the amount of money that they've raised for, uh, the nonprofit. Sun Valley Tour de Force has supported the Hunger Coalition through this no speed limit flagship event since 2020. Tour de Force hasn't given us their final count yet, but they say it is a record high number of donations. Here's those final donation figures going back to 2020. You can see it's grown rapidly and continues to grow. These donations come from an auction over the weekend. Of course, drivers paying $5,000 to participate. All that money goes back to the coalition. And Brian, it's important to note as well that that 2020 event, they didn't have one, mm -hmm. still were able to scrap up $15,000 together. You can see the difference, 600,000, 15,000. Okay, so $5,000 to enter. I've got an 85 Cabriolet sitting in my driveway. Can I pay $5,000 and run that race? There is a wait list, so you would probably want to get in touch sooner rather yeah. than later. Um, but yeah, I mean, that guy had a pickup truck and he was the first one to get going, so he must know somebody. And there's a limit to the number they accept. Yep. Interesting, still, that's a lot of money and a lot of speed mm -hmm. and a lot of good causes. Thank you very much, Andrew.
How many times have you driven by the Shree Buckner Webb Park in downtown Boise? Seen that big pink tree with the swings attached to it and thought, that's pretty cool. Well, you're not the only one who's noticing those things. The CODA Awards, Collaboration of Design and Art, looks at the projects that most successfully integrate commissioned art into interior, architectural, or even public spaces. Public spaces like Shree Buckner Webb Park, that's where this story takes us. The iconic pink tree there at the park is up for such a CODA Award. It joins 100 other pieces from around the world as a finalist. A final evaluation is now underway, and the piece, officially called Gentle Breeze, created by New York artist Matthew Mazzotta. He tells the two wait from the creation came from learning from the people of Boise. I interviewed a whole bunch of people in Boise. We actually did this thing called an outdoor living room where we put domestic furniture, composes a living room downtown. I can't remember what street. But I just would ask all these questions. And the theme that came out the strongest was, you know, we love where we live, but it is this unique balance that many people don't know, maybe from the outside, which is we got the urban, but we also have the mountains and the river. I could work downtown and then go fishing or go out into the hills. What kept on coming to me was like, let's do something that harks back to that rural, the pastoral, you know, the prairie or whatever. So can we bring a tree uh, and a tree swing, something that would remind people this is not just all about urban density or urban fabric. This is about people that live and get this experience of both. So that's what happened. We basically put a we put a berm and then you climb up this little path. And when you get up there, it's a tree on a hill. So it's a beautiful image of this tree that you look up to. You got tree swings for people interactivity. But then each of the uh, little leaves on the tree, I think there's like over uh, 300 plus they all move because of the wind that blows through the city. So they're kind of an indicator of this kind of other essence that surrounds the city. Uh, you might have heard this from many people. Once you spend some time in Boise, you're like, huh, this really is good. And I, I don't know if there was a little sentiment of too many people moving into Boise, but I got the same bite when I was there. I was like, this is totally livable. Like, if you live here, you got kind of everything. So anyways, I just reflect that back that, yeah, it's a great place, you know. It is a great place, you know. Voting is underway right now. Check out CODA, WORX.com to vote. And we'll have a link in this story on our website uh, coming up at KTVB.com. Again, only 100 pieces around the world are up for this award. You know, Idaho has a lot of interesting history, not just parks like that. Much of, has happened here in the Gem State. Maybe you haven't even heard about a lot of it. And there are several ways you can go about learning some of those things. The Internet, history books, you can watch it here on the 208. You can take a class if you have time for that. Or you could go to the Idaho State Museum, walk away with something to remember about what you learned. Something like, I don't know, trading cards. Like this one, which tells the tale of Lonesome Larry, a story you've also heard here on the 208, but this card is pretty cool. It's the famous sockeye salmon from uh, the Redfish Lake area, swimming those 900 miles, the one fish that came back, and so they decided they were gonna name it well, Lonesome Larry, and everybody kind of came after him. His journey is considered a critical moment for saving sockeyes from extinction in that uh, river. There's also a card about Geronimo the parachuting beaver. Yep, that's right. You also heard about that on the 208. 1948, Fish and Game came up with the idea to relocate some annoying beavers by dropping them out of airplanes with parachutes on the back of their boxes. That's what they did. How about an early video game that revolved around a famous trip through Idaho, the Oregon Trail? The game was developed in the early 70s as a way to teach kids about the realities of pioneer life. You can play a version of the game at the Idaho State Museum right now, by the way. The last one, Skiing Spud, which references the fact the very first destination ski resort was built right here in Idaho with the very first ski lift as well. These cards are part of Idaho's museum's Idaho Did You Know campaign. The museum says the cards are only available for a limited time. You do have to get to the museum to get one. You can get one card per visit per person, so you can't get them all at once. So that means you got to go back. Museum officials say the campaign's wrapping up next month or so, and they're already looking forward to what they'll come up with next year.
Jack in Boise pointing out the irony of the St. Luke's Bundy Rodriguez case saying complaining about the uh, lawsuits making a mockery of our system of justice. I was told by Rodriguez today they do plan to appeal so they plan to continue it at least for a little bit longer.